Okay, it is that time. Welcome to episode three of Suggestive Language. I am your host, Lucas Brooks. This is the weekly show where I trick amazing people into hanging out with me and documenting the evidence. It's going to be a great time tonight. I am so happy to introduce my fabulous guest. She is a storytelling host, a storyteller, a sex educator, a burlesker, um, and a cat parent, at least temporarily, please welcome to the screens and your ear holes, Diva Darling. Hey, Lucas, how are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Um, I'm really excited to have you here for an assortment of reasons, but particularly the one that jumps out is that you were the first person to ask to be on this show. And that meant a lot to me. You asked it in front of a live audience. <laughs> So you where know, there was plenty of opportunity, <laughs> there's plenty of opportunity for me to be like, uh, sure. But no, I replied with gusto because you are already on my list. Yeah. Um, now, so where do I start? So Diva and I have some stuff in common because um, I've touched on this on the show slightly before, but not wholeheartedly. Um, when life is real, I host the Boston chapter of a dirty storytelling night called Smut Slam. And Diva is the host of the DC branch. And Diva is actually the reason I am able to do it in Boston by a long convoluted path. <laughs> now, um, do you want to talk about it or should I? Um, I guess we could trade off. Sure, sure. We talk about oh, the beginning of Catalyst Con. Like Catalyst Con, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the first... We didn't actually meet there, but we were aware of each other in the space at an event called Catalyst Con, uh, or Catalyst Con East, to be specific, because there was two. Uh, it's a event, or it was an event. I don't think it's happening more anywhere, is it? I don't think so. Uh, yeah, I missed it. It was a really good time. Yeah. Were you there both the years that I was there? I th yeah. Yeah. Um, times. Yeah, it was a great... Um, event where sex educators and sex nerds and um, all types of people of that nature got together at a big hotel in DC and presented workshops and panels. And, you know, I saw you, you saw me, we just never engaged. Um, but now we're totally in the throes of a smut slam land and it's wonderful. Um, but please share your take on the whole thing. So, um, well, first I want to bookmark, because if we have a chance, there's a, a story about how Catalyst Con relates to me becoming a sex educator that I think is kind of cool. Yes, so yes, please. Later. Um, but this was my second year coming to Catalyst Con, and um, I saw that there was a panel for performers who did sex-themed work. And I'm a burlesque performer. I produce theater. And I was like, hey, I got to check this out. And um, Lucas was running the panel, and uh, Cameron Moore, who founded Smut Slam, was one of the speakers. And she's just a force of nature. She is a, a former phone sex operator, an activist, an educator, an artist who has like, toured her one-woman shows worldwide. She's just incredible. And um, she was talking about the about these one-woman shows. Like She wasn't even talking about Smut Slam. And... Um, she was saying like, you know, I'm trying to arrange some of my tour stops coming up. I'm going to be, and the, the, the con was happening in the DC area. She's like, I'm going to be coming back in November to uh, do my show phone whore. And I am looking for, um, you know, local people who can help me out with like venues or producers or, you know, like just any contacts. And I was all about the networking that weekend. So I was like, oh, I've got to talk to this woman. Went up to her afterwards and I was like, hey, like I, you know, I'm in the theater world. I know a ton of people like I'm sure I can hook you up with whatever you need. So we met in the lobby later on to talk about it. And she kind of explained what phone whore was like she had some caveats about like the very raw nature of it that she wanted to tell me about. And so we had this great conversation about it. And like and she's just like, bah, 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 like mile a minute kind of thing. And she gets up and leaves. And I just sat there and like we talked for like a half hour and I was like. I think I just agreed to produce her DC stop. 
<laughs> and so sure enough, like next thing I knew, like I'm, you know, helping this one woman show come into DC and get a venue and get everything set up. And, um, and Cameron likes to do other events when she is in a, an area with her show. So she wanted to do workshops. So we were setting that up. And she said, I do this thing called Smut Slam and it's a dirty storytelling show and, you know, you can maybe help build audience, whatever. So we threw it together in like the course of a week, um, just scrambling to get a venue and get promotion out and whatever. And because it was like so last minute and it's, you know, kind of a, like one of those concepts that a lot of people are like, Hmm, I, I, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Um, I think that the, we had like uh, maybe six people on the judges panel, the judges almost outnumbered the people who actually attended. It was so tiny. We moved it into the smallest space. We're like, we're going to, we're going to power through this, you know? And, um, and we did the whole thing. And of course we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what goes on at a smut slam, but we got done and the room was just charged. We were so bonded. Everybody had had such a great time. Everyone stayed for like an hour afterwards, just like talking and like just this buzz of energy. And it was so great. And so me and uh, one of my burlesque colleagues, Mindy Mimosa, separately that evening went up to Cameron and were like, is there any way we can keep doing this like after you, you've gone? And it just turned out that she had had some thoughts about basically franchising it. So the next day, the three of us met up at the diner in Adams Morgan and sat there for like three hours and like hammered out the licensing agreement and the structure and like what needed to happen and the branding and like all of these kind of these things and like just created this model so that we could do smut slam dc and once we got it off the the year we got it off the ground it was um february of uh it was valentine's day 2016 that we had our first actual official smut slam and uh since then like the, the, within that first year it just exploded and it you know became this like international thing <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, that is the whole reason I'm able to do it now. Cause later in December of that year, Cameron was in Boston and doing a smut slam. And I was like, I got to go to this. I mean, I obviously are new Cameron and want to be part of her stuff. And, um, you know, I showed up and, uh, I signed up to tell a story because I already talk about my sex life on stage all the time. Why not? And she had mentioned that she was sort of expanding with the franchise thing in on stage and i was like oh really but i wasn't ready to say anything but then at the end of the show i said goodbye to her and she's like lucas have you hosted shows before and i was kind enough not to be like um i hosted you on a panel <laughs> but, um, but yeah so she bestowed the opportunity on me as well and it's been a huge gift um but it wasn't until a couple months ago on a uh the book launch we'll talk about the book in a little bit where i realized that you met cameron at the panel that i put her on so i got a little cocky and was like you're welcome but <laughs> you know it just made me feel part of something magical in the universe and that's a grateful feeling in a motherfucking pandemic um and also i was so glad i did that panel because uh i mean mainly because i got to well i would met cameron but i never got to see her perform and she did some snippets uh at the urban erotica show that night and i was blown away mm -hmm. like i've seen a lot of one man shows i've done a lot of one person shows i've done many of my own but i was not ready for how fantastic cameron was um so shout out to cameron Moore. please stalk her respectfully everywhere you can on the internet uh she is a bombshell so tell me about the bookmark that you wanted to implement the in terms of how catalyst con launched your sex education stuff yeah so um kind of it's been a long time since i thought of this story but we're talking about it and i was like wow it was a life-changing event for me in so many ways so the year before we had that panel um was the first year that i went to catalyst con and um, I only went because uh, one of my very, very dear friends, Del Tashlin, was one of the keynote speakers on the panel um, for the first night. And he and I had this whole like 
let's go on adventures thing that was like kind of a cornerstone of our our friendship and we hadn't been able to do that in a while and he was like hey i'm gonna be the keynote speaker at this sex nerd con i think you're gonna love it come with me and like be my eye candy and i was like sex nerd conference rock on i'm there um and this was like i think very early in my burlesque career too so like i was just kind of starting out on this whole you know new path in life and um so i showed up and very like duly fulfilled my role as eye candy like all my retro glam and we go and you know it's of course this big dinner the first night and there's the keynote panel and i'm listening to these amazing speakers and they're so inspirational and they're saying these things that are just like speaking to me and i can feel that i'm in like a room with my people and i just had this thought like i want to come back in like a year and be peers with these people and you know i was working this like nonprofit arts job and like i said i just started burlesque so like this was just really becoming part of my life so the very next thing was like this little voice in the back of my head just kind of out of nowhere was like maybe you should look into local sex stores and i was like come on like go away, little voice in my head. I don't make enough at my nonprofit job. Surely I'm not going to make enough at like some retail job, like regardless of, you know, the fact that I'm in a, a you know, DC, this very like, you know, high end area. Um, there's no way I can make a living working at a sex store. Stupid idea. So I just like threw it away. And I kid you not, like, two or three days after the conference, after getting back from the conference, um, I was reading Facebook and one of my friends who I knew worked at one of our local sex stores, uh, Lotus Blooms, um, she posted something and said, um, all that whole winter, she'd never slipped on the ice once, but she like dropped like one drop of whatever this particular lube was and she just went flying down the stairs. <sighs> And I was like, you, and I commented and I was like, you really need to like put that in like your email blast or your advertising or something like, so your customers know like how amazing this lube is. And I was already like doing a lot of marketing stuff through my nonprofit job. And she commented back and she was like, that's amazing. Like we have to do that. Do you want to come do marketing for the store? And I was like, whoa, dude, like, like, you know, this little like synchronous, like thought in my head was like, holy shit, like, that's amazing. So I was like, are you kidding? And she's like, no, like, we desperately need help with marketing. And uh, like, and at first I was like, well, that's fine. But you know, like, it's still a store, I probably can't make enough money, blah, blah, blah. And I kind of put it off and put it off. And like every month or two, like she would come back and she'd be like, so do you, do you want to come work at the store? And I was like, I really do, but, uh, and so it probably took me the better part of a year before I actually like applied and like got a job doing marketing for the store. And, um, they're, I, I'm freelance now and they're still one of my clients, so I'm still working for them. But like that, like launched me doing sex workshops. Um, it launched me, I created the blog for the store and I do most of the blogging for it. So it really launched like a lot of the writing work that I do as a sex educator. Um, they became a sponsor of Smutslam DC. So like just this whole, like a whole new life, whole new world opened up as a result of me going to Catalyst Con to be eye candy for my friend who was on the keynote panel. I love that you and I are similar and that we both got into sex education by accident. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, semi-accident for me, because I mean, I, when I, um, it was my last year of college, I was writing my first one-man show for my senior thesis uh, that involved me getting college credit for talking on stage in my underwear and a leather harness. Um, but, uh, you know, I wrote about my sex life on a blog for a while, and then I was like, hmm, I need a new job. I'm not happy where I'm at. Uh, and then I applied at Bayland in New York City. I waited and waited and was like, probably nothing's going to happen. Then one day they called them like, hey, can you come in for your interview today? And I was like, I got time. And then I interviewed and two hours later, I had the job. Um, but teaching never really occurred to me as part of the job. But then during training, I found out that you can train to be a workshop teacher. And I was like, I like the stage. 
like, I can do this. I like um, people look at me while I talk. <laughs> yeah, and then like, for Catalyst Con, um, you know, I applied initially. I applied with um, my one man show. I think I think with Cootie Catcher or with maybe a couple options. Uh, but I was like, I don't know if this is your thing, but this is what I do, and please let me do it. And the first year, they were like, we don't have a spot for your kind of um, presentation in the in the con this year but do you want to be on this panel it was literally called the ass panel <laughs> and it, it was being presented by ruby rider or moderated by ruby rider and um ct shank and oh my god i'm drawing tom from sport sheets i'm drawing a blank on his last name but um, I was replacing Charlie Glickman, who oh, had wow. done it for the LA presentation. And I was like so intimidated. But I also knew that this was probably a better deal than what I was get, what I was asking for in the first place. And I met so many amazing people that we probably both met at that yeah. event. So I miss it. Um, and then I got to do my show the next year. So, huh. Um, so during this lockdown year of our lord 2020 um i'm probably beating that phrase into the ground and i'm only slightly sorry um but you compiled a smut slam book in, in, in to put it into a few words it's a lot more than that but obviously we need to talk about it and not just because i contributed like a couple paragraphs <laughs> to talk about because you did something really awesome. So, um, yeah, so the Smut Slam empire, as it were, has been going on for five years now. Um, Smut Slam itself is 10 years old. And um, one of the things that is part of Smut Slam, besides people like it being an open mic for people to get up and talk about their sex lives, um, we have something called the Fuck Bucket. And the Fuck Bucket is in real like live shows, not the virtual ones we're having now, is a physical bucket and we have forms and um, people can write anonymous questions or confessions and put them in the bucket. And then the host will read them out loud in between storytellers. And it's like a good way to like sort of, you know, have some banter, tap dance, a little sex education, whatever, like while the judges are, you know, coming up with their scores. And sometimes you need to fill a little time because people are shy about telling stories, whatever it is. So it's a great mechanism. Um, it's a great way for people to contribute who don't really have a story, but they have like a thought or there is a question that they've been like afraid to ask or something like that. Honestly, like the questions are one of my favorite part of shows because I have to be prepared to answer like literally anything from like relationship type questions about, you know, polyamory or whatever through like the mechanics of butt sex or pegging or, you know, um, sounding or, you know, God knows whatever it is through like recommending brands for stuff like, you know, whatever. So, um, and I love it because it's a chance to really unpack um, people's assumptions about stuff. Like, Somebody, for example, would put something in, say, like, I've never had an orgasm. And of course, immediately the room goes like, oh, and so like the thing that I've been doing when I get stuff like that is, um, you know, like if the, if this is somebody who's never had one who wants one, then yeah, like, oh, indeed. But, you know, we're making the assumption that they actually want to. And it's OK if you don't want to. And if that's not something you're interested in and if you're, you know, on the asexual spectrum or, you know, whatever. So anyway, I'm getting totally off the point, but one of my favorite. I'm a tangent. I told you. <laughs> so, like um, I always call it like using the sparkle to bring the substance. Cause like everyone comes in like, ah, oh, it's going to be a rowdy bar night, whatever. And I'm like, ah, oh, going to educate you. Um, <laughs> Sucker, so, you going to learn something. Right. And I mean, these things are, th these papers are just gold. And um, so, many so some of us the hosts like we saved them like well i've saved like every fuck bucket form i've ever gotten i know cameron has just a ton of them that she's toted around the world and we always wanted to do something with them and cameron's was like you know hey like let's do a zine 
and she actually went ahead and worked with a Berlin artist because she's working out of Berlin now. Um, and she picked a few of her favorite fuck buckets and got an illustrator to uh, do illustrations for them that like incorporated the confession. And it was like 16 pages and it was like super like, you know, like throwback to the 1990s, like total, you know, kind of zine uh, aesthetic. And, um, and I thought it was really cool. But of course, like I always go to 11. So I'm like, how can we make this even bigger? And I did notice that when I put them out at my merch table for my shows, like that was one thing that people consistently went for. And um, so at some point, when Mindy was still co-hosting with me, we came up with the idea of like, Hey, like, let's do a book. And we had enough just from DC that we thought like, Oh, we'll do the smut slam DC book. And you know, that'll be great. And like, it'll be something we can put on our merch table and maybe each city will do their own and you know, that kind of thing. And then Mindy stopped producing with me and I still wanted to do the project. And I talked to Cameron about it. She was really excited. And I was like, you know, it would be even cooler if this was a smut slam international thing and we got people from you know all over the world contributing to this so um this was my one of my pandemic projects uh, we finally cracked down we did an indiegogo to raise money to uh help with the offset the costs and we were doing everything on a a shoestring and we collected god over 200 of our favorite confessions um and got them all like typed up and some of them were scanned and whatever. And we got, we contracted five artists from around the world to do, uh, to illustrate. Um, I think we end up with 14 illustrations based on different fuck buckets. And then, um, well, Lucas, for the benefit of the audience, Lucas and I, and uh, Helvetica Bold, who's the host of Smut Slam Ottawa and Cameron herself, um, we each answered we picked out five questions each and we answered those. And then, um, so we would work, I organized the book. So it was like, here's like a, you know, confessions that are about like having sex in different locations. And like, and then here's a section where we have like five questions going on. And then, you know, here's an illustration or whatever. Um, so, you know, it's a pretty, um, pretty meaty little tome for what it is. And uh, the thing that makes me very exceptionally proud of it is not just like, I worked so hard with, Cameron herself and with these amazing hosts who gave such good material and these artists who created like very distinct, beautiful styles of erotic art. Um, the whole thing just came together so perfectly, but it also required me because we didn't have money to hire a layout artist or a cover artist or an editor or a proofreader <laughs> or anything basically. So that was all me. And so I learned how to, format an ebook and format a print book and all that kind of thing and like what constitutes a good cover and all that kind of stuff all by myself with my the, the help of my little indesign program thank god i have that so um so yeah and it turned out wonderfully we had a launch party that um lucas and a bunch of the other contributors came to and um you know we showed images and did some readings and told some stories it was a good old time and now we have this thing that like, we also put some material in there about like, kind of what is the fuck bucket? What is a smut slam? What's the code of conduct? All that kind of stuff. So if somebody just randomly picks it up, like it's entertaining because you're reading about, you know, people's sex lives, but you're also like kind of getting a look at what it's like to go to a smut slam. So I'm kind of hoping that might be a little recruitment tool when we actually have live shows again. Right. So yeah. And it's volume yep. one, so <laughs> more to come. This is just the beginning, maybe. Um, that was a perfect segue. I thank you for that. Um, you talked about, you know, a, a, a peek at what Smut Slam looks like. Now, because I've only done mine and seen the one that Cameron did, which is pretty much what I modeled the Boston chapter after, what, what does the DC Smut Slam look like? Um, the, I think the biggest difference... Well, of course, the first difference used to be that there were two hosts um, instead of just one. And Lindy and I had, we were, you know, we were, we were less colleagues, we were BFFs, like we had a great dynamic, like we were both like kind of type A stage manager -y types. So like we worked really well together on the production end, but we also had like a really 
fun dynamic on stage and um, people really responded to that. Um, now that, of course, I'm producing it solo now, but I started producing it solo last February. So I got one live show down by myself before we went to the virtual format. Um, so I think the other big difference is um, Cameron tends to prefer to be like super real, like kind of gritty, like she really likes the dive bar aesthetic, like, you know, this like kind of feeling of like, people intimately kind of crowded in and everyone's like in their street clothes and you know just having like kind of in like underground good time and we do have some of that but like because we're burlesque performers we basically like immediately came and we were like you know what we're going to be wearing sequins on stage you know we're going to be kind of outrageous and fabulous and like we would do um themed stuff like uh september is always uh it, it always manages to fall either on or very close to international talk like a pirate day. So we always do a pirate theme show and I've not yet exhausted my well of um, pirate double entendres and booty jokes. So, so the tradition continues, but you know, like a lot of the people who come to the show are totally nerdy and they go to the Ren Fair and they, you know, they're my people. So, um, so I'm like, Hey, bring your Ren Fair garb, pretend it's pirate weekend. And everyone's like, yo, ho, ho, drink all the rum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, God. I think the other big difference that we have is, um, that we were fortunate to have big enough spaces. Like they still have that kind of dive bar feel to them, but, um, the the venue not the one that i was in when pandemic started but the one right before that which unfortunately closed had a whole separate room with the bar like right next to our performance space and so we were able to have a lounge in the pre-show area so we had like porn magazines scattered around for people to look at we called it like the introverts corner and uh, and of course there was the bar and we had themed drinks that were like named after different aspects of the show and um and we had community partner tables so like the shirt that i'm wearing the be nice to sex workers because sex work is real work is one of, is a core value of smut slam dc snap, um, snap. and so uh this shirt comes from an organization called hips which is a, a harm reduction um direct services agency in dc they do a lot of advocacy they work with sex-based street workers drug users a lot they do a lot of work uh, with trans rights, you know, just, they do just do amazing, amazing stuff. And so they were one of our partners and Planned Parenthood was another one of them. And they would come and table in, uh, the, the pre-show time as well. So building that sort of like real community network was like really important to us. Like, you know, we were so, because unlike when Cameron started and she was traveling all around, we're so entrenched in DC that we were, you know, we're like, we're making this community. We're really like, making contact with like everybody in the dc area who you know has any connection to sex whatsoever um we had the dc department of health uh take over our judges panel um one month and uh those guys like man they are cool like <laughs> they they want you to have a vibrator because they're like vibrators are part of sexual health and i was like you go dc department of health You're like you guys rock so um yeah like we'd have a little bit of everything um, and I think also like one of the things that I tend to do is, um, I like to like kind of really go with whatever's happening and like jump on opportunities that arise. So like one time we had a guy telling a story that involved him spontaneously giving people a lap dance and doing a striptease for them. And so I made a joke afterwards. I was like, oh man, like, I wish I could see that striptease. And he was like, I'll do it. And everyone in the room's like, yes, we want to see it. And he's like, really? Like, and I was, he's like, could I do it? And I was like, all right, I'll tell you what, you remain bar legal and you can totally do it. And I pulled up music and he did the strip tease for everybody. And it was amazing. Like he was not a burlesque performer. He's just a guy. Like, I think he's in finance. <laughs> That's hot. I love right? that. <laughs> So like those so, are the kinds of things that are just oh so dear to my heart and you know you never know when when stuff like that's going to happen and 
you know, when something's going to change somebody's life and when somebody's going to meet somebody, you know, start a relationship there. I'm waiting. I'm wait. I'm determined to have the first Smut Slam proposal. It's going to happen. <laughs> I never thought about that, but I love that. Right. Um, I it, that I mean that the that whole lap dance situation that would not fly <laughs> at mine <laughs> not because of me because I love a good uh, impromptu strip tease but um, that is given with consent but um, you know my event it happens at um, if you're in the Boston area at Arts at the Armory in Somerville in the cafe which is a small space mm-hmm. max capacity is probably like forty. Um, and you know, you say you have a six judge panel. I only ever have three. Um, oh, I've cut so, it down to three. <laughs> it's just too much. You got to get your three. Okay. Um, because, because the judge form always says like judge number up to judge number five. And they're all like, who, what, how? Like, like, this is how we're going to do the math. It's really easy. Right. And I'll explain it. And they're like, oh, okay, good. Um, but at, towards the end, I ended up doing like repeated judges just because I like having people who are already comfortable with the environment. But um, yeah, it would be like, 35 audience average probably three judge panel just me hosting and like jeans and a t-shirt no sparkles although i'm always tempted um and uh the cafe they, they have beer and wine but no liquor which is probably good for me and for everyone else uh just in terms of maintaining a healthy atmosphere yeah. um but uh I don't know what your fuck buckets are like. Well, you told me a little bit, but mine ha- mine are very confession heavy, mm-hmm. and a lot of them are very obscure. And I feel like they're intentionally trying to make me blush or <laughs> have a fit of laughter. Usually, they're successful. Um, I didn't think to um, keep any of my former fuck bucket submissions. And I'm really mad now that, you know, once you announced that the book was going to happen, I'm like, oh, I didn't save any because like you know, an anonymity and stuff. I felt like maybe I should just <laughs> toss them in the recycle bin. But um, the, unless there was something that was like relevant to me personally, like one person wrote me a really lovely message about, because I'm always saying like, you know, trying to make sure that this is, clearly Cameron's baby. Um, but after probably like a year, someone left me a really lovely note about, you know, you really create a wonderful environment. Really, This really is your baby mm-hmm. to a certain degree. And like, I just had, I had a really lovely, like loyal following. Um, but, uh, and also some very, very strange fuck bucket submissions. Um, so now you're doing it online. Yes. You were doing it online for a year. Mm-hmm. Has, how has that changed? I mean, obviously people are not in person, but aside right. from that, what's different about doing it in person versus online? Um, like I've been there, but I'd like to hear you <laughs> describe it better. The <clears throat> the structure of the show is the same. It took us, took Cameron and I a couple of months um, to kind of iron out all the, how we're going to do everything. Um because the minute that everything shut down, she was like, right, like, let's figure out how to do this online. And I was like, right there with you. Um, so right now I'm doing Smut Slam DC virtually and she's doing Smut Slam Europe. And those are the only two shows that are currently running. Um, but we still have all our you know, hosts and supporters and you know, we're working behind the scenes to keep things going. Um, so um, one of the big changes is that, one of the big differences um, is that I, I feel like I, I miss the live dynamic. Like there's a, an energy that gets created in the room that it, you can't really recreate virtually. Um, I do still think like people bond really well and, um, you know, they, they have a good time and like, they really get into it, whatever. Um, but I feel like there's like a level of, of safety, like everyone's in their like little bubble. So um you know so it is more like watching like a tv show or a movie or something even though you can interact with it and i think that the benefit of that is that people who are really shy um about it they can come they don't have to turn their cameras on um they can kind of just lurk and see what it's about um and so that's kind of that's an advantage obviously one of the big differences is that people from anywhere in the world can attend which is really cool 
um, because I'm always trying to grow audience. And there are a lot of people that I know, you know, nationally or internationally um, who are never in town when I'm doing a live show. So like they finally get to to see it. Um, I think the biggest positive thing that is different is the existence of chat. Um, Because I encourage people to keep a steady chat stream going throughout the show. Um, you know, I, I tell people, like, I have a chat moderator to make sure that nobody's being an asshole, um, because they'll get bounced if they are. And, uh, and I tell people, like, don't, you know, try not to be distracting if somebody's telling a story, but, like, the advantage of having the chat there is that it's not too distracting if there's just, you know, stuff appearing there while somebody's talking. Um, and that's added a really cool dimension because you get like people will post like little bits of commentary or ask questions or, you know, like whatever, like while stuff is going on. And I think it adds a level of interactivity. that's a very different way that like it, it kind of replaces that sort of like, Oh, we're all in a room together, you know, sort of dynamic. And it's a very different feel, but I think it ends up serving a lot of the same purpose. Um, Unfortunately, the other difference is that it's a lot harder to bring an audience <laughs> because people got burned out on virtual events within about a month and a half at most. Um, and uh, especially now that things are starting to open up and people want to be out of the house and doing things, it's like trying to convince people to be on their computer screens for another two hours in a day is tough. But we still have like our core you know, demographic. I'll still generally get like around 50 people in the show so you know it's not like it's a ghost town or anything but i'm like oh man like i used to sell out like 110 115 tickets at every show and like you know like it's it feels so much smaller but you know the diehards come and like those people like they really really want to be there so that's been pretty great and i'm just i'm honestly i'm glad that i'm able to keep doing it like it is a little breath of fresh air for you know especially towards the beginning, like there were a lot of people who were like, all I've been thinking about is like this COVID stuff and just being able to do something fun that really took my mind off of it made a huge difference. So for that, I'm really glad. Right. And like, I have been really impressed with the way that you've been able to keep it going because like, you know, at the beginning, the just not being able to be on stage in any capacity kicked my mental health in the ass. And I, like, I, I have been terrible at attending virtual shows. I've been terrible at do, about doing them. Um, and I'm just getting my energy back around now, thus this show. Mm-hmm. Um, so I am I feel bad that I haven't been able to keep Smut Slam Boston going virtually, but I'm really glad that my people, I don't know if they are going to you, but I'm glad that they can. I know um, I definitely had somebody from that area, like not long ago, so I was very happy about that. Oh, you know what I thought of the other thing that is different that is really good is that um, it is more accessible for people with physical limitations, um, like mobility limitations. That was always a big thing. Like DC, one of the biggest problems with small performance um, events is that almost any place that um, fits your event that's willing to have it, that has the right licensing for it, especially when you're looking at bars and they have to have like entertainment licenses and stuff like that, their performance spaces are almost always in the basement or on an upper floor and the buildings are old enough that they're not required to have handicapped accessibility. Mm. And like that, and that eats at me because our, all of our shows are ASL interpreted, um, which is, you know, it's a big investment, but it's one that, you know, we've made gladly for the the extent the time that we've been able to do it we have a terrific team of asl interpreters who work with us and we make efforts to make things economically accessible um that was something that i also kind of stepped up when we went into pandemic um i started uh i created a gift ticket so that people can just get on there and if they're in hardship they can just get a free ticket and then other people can donate towards there being gift tickets available um you know, so that I'm not, you know, going totally broke on, on, you know, my expenses or whatever, but uh, also people who are in hardship are able to go. So that's something I'm definitely going to continue with the live shows. 
Um, but yeah, I could never get around the, the physical accessibility. And, um, and it's really making me think about like when we do get back to doing live shows, like how, like, am I going to go back to the same venue? Is, am I going to be able to, first of all, if I'm not like, am, can I find a place that is more physically accessible? Um, and also like, can I find a place where it's not quite so bar heavy? Like there's more sober options because that's really becoming an accessibility awareness thing. Like, I mean, it always has been, but I think more people are talking about the need for sober adult events. Um, and I don't want, you know, people to not be able to drink entirely, but I would like it to not feel like as high pressure, uh, a thing as, as I think it is when you like show up at a bar where you have to like make your bar minimum <laughs> or to get the space. Yeah. I, uh, am very fortunate in that I haven't had that problem. Um, because it, the way we do it in Boston, and this is based on the model that Cameron implemented that, uh, the way the venue works, it's like, if you do suggest a donation, you can just have the space for free and they keep all what they make at the cafe. Um, and, you know, I see smut slams or I have seen smut slam events posted talking about like, you know, yours, New York, uh, anywhere that has them. And it's always in a bar. And I just can't imagine as someone who likes many a cocktail, I can't imagine doing Smut Slam in a place that has many a cocktail. So <laughs> that is so fascinating. And like, I almost wish we could do like a trading spaces kind of thing. Right? That would be so cool. I mean, well, yeah, when we have live shows again, like I, d I really want to get around to see more of the other slams, the ones that I'm able to travel. Yeah. We had one month, I had a class of budding sex educators coming in from American University because I'd been working with their class. And I had to get special dispensation from our venue um, for people 18 plus to be able to come in and, you know, be marked and whatever. And, um, and it was a great experience for them because they were learning about like how adult sex education can work. And this was like a, like something like most of them had never even imagined was possible. And, um, and it was just a great experience having them there and, you know, getting reactions from it and like getting, letting them be exposed to, you know, the kind of stuff that we do and whatever. So, uh, you know, what it's like to create a really safe space and to, you know, how you keep safeguards around that and things like that. And so I managed to keep that, like, even when we moved on to the next venue after that, but I was like, you know, like that, that, that was another consideration too, is like, I want you know, that 18 to 21 year old group to be able to come in and, and see what we do as well. Yeah. I never thought about that. That's yeah, great. Like they, I mean, they're already getting shitty sex education. Like let them come to something where there's like, it's queer friendly and trans friendly and like very progressive. And like, we know what we're talking about and it's entertaining and like, you want to listen, like, you know, kind of fill in a lot of those gaps there. Um, I was hoping you could tell me a little about, like, I, I know a little bit, but um, the platform you use for Smut Slam. Yes. Because I think more people need to know about it, and you know way more about it than I do. But I love um, it. It's so cool. Um, my friend Sarah Massey, who is just a huge mover and shaker, one of her claims to fame is that she instigated the big queer dance party outside Mike Pence's house that was, like, reported on in the news. Oh, um, I didn't know that. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, she was the uh, she was working with the LGBT uh, coalition headquarters in DC at the time, and I mean she wasn't doing it as a part of her job. I don't think she was just doing it because that's the kind of person she is. Um, she's like another force of nature. She's amazing. So she got stuck in Paris, um, taking care of her parents when things shut down. Like she deliberately was like, "I'm going to be trapped in Paris and not be able to go home, but I'm going to stay here and you know take care of them." So she had to leave her job and sell all her stuff and like, you know, just completely like renovate her entire life. And so she was like, what can I do for the queer community? You know, while I'm locked down, like, how can I make this work? And so she wanted to start doing, um, I think the, the origin of it um, was her queer naked dance parties, which are still happening every Saturday. 
Um, you don't actually have to be naked, but a lot of people do. Like, and it was basically it's kind of like a Zoom party, but like yeah, there's a DJ, and it's like kind of a weird combination of like being in a nightclub, but also being able to talk to people in chat and not have to shout. <laughs> um, I went. I went to one. It was really cute. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of fun, and. Um, so I don't remember if she, I, I feel like she might have tried to start it on Zoom. And Zoom, of course, is not super sex positive or friendly to those things. And so yeah, we're all jacking off on Zoom all the time anyway. I'm like, I need a new job. Why don't I just start a business? So she started a company uh, called Joie de Vivre and uh, developed what she was calling the Joy Platform. And the Joy Platform is, you know, a, a, a video meeting service like I mean, that makes it sound really boring. A video event service, I should say. But it's, you know, familiar like the one we're using for this or, you know, Zoom or you know, like any of those where you can be on camera with a lot of people. And um, hers was very specifically, it was queer centric and it was sex positive and it was very focused on privacy and security. So there were like additional layers of security so that you wouldn't get people bombing your events. It was very privacy minded. So there was no like, Com like the company was not spying on your events like some other companies do that I could mention. Um, and, uh, and basically like she could control, you know, what went on there. And she focused on bringing in partners who are going to produce events on there. And, you know, she started with her queer naked dance party and, you know, expanded it out. There was like queer yoga and naked poetry and like some other stuff like that. There were some kink workshops. She partnered with uh, Folsom Street to do like all of their, a lot of their virtual programming. And um, since we've been friends for a long time and she was a Smut Slam fan, she judged for me many a time. Um, we, you know, we talked about it and I was like, yeah, like, you know, I've been doing this on Zoom with Cameron and like, I'm totally into the idea of supporting a new business and trying this out. And um, so it's a, you know, a little different model, but um, you know, we have that, peace of mind of knowing that we're in a place that like not only welcomes us but like helps promote the events as well and you know where i can tell people like hey we're on this platform go to their events page and you're going to see a whole lot of other stuff that you're going to enjoy um you know because i'm always getting people who come smut slam are like i've never been to anything like this what else is like this what else can i go see and i'm like all right like i have a whole page on my uh smut slam website that's you know that's all like other stuff that you will probably like if you like smut slam but you know here on on the platform i'm like you've got a whole schedule of stuff that you can attend um and of course like knowing the owner of the company and knowing all the tech people and like having that direct line of contact is great for anything that might come up and being able to tell them stuff like hey like here's uh here's something that if you can figure out how to do would make it really a lot easier for uh, our ASL interpreters to be effective, you know, and stuff like that. And they're listening and they're taking it to heart and they're developing all that stuff. So great. So great. I was, I was like really blown away the first time I attended a DC Smut Slam online and saw, saw this platform. I'm like, Oh my God, this is, I'm so glad this exists. Yes. Um, I am still trying to figure out ways that I can use it, but it's, uh, it's, it's, on the back of my brain just as like a performer and you know right. <laughs> cuz like for this I was like I don't want to do tickets for this cuz I want people to see me um <laughs> but uh it's it's something I want to utilize for sure yeah um back to the topic that is off topic that I wanted to introduce so you're fostering kittens right now I am and this is very exciting information and I got to hear them a little bit earlier how is that going it's so great like I knew about fostering for a really long time and I really wanted to do it. And our local shelter, um, at, at the point where I was like, okay, I can totally do this. They weren't accepting new foster parents. And, um, once the pandemic hit and everything shut down, um, they were trying to get as many animals out of the shelters they could so that they could have like, you know, next to nobody actually in the building. So they were like, Hey, like now we got to open up and get more, foster parents so my household jumped on it and um and we we started off the the first animal that they gave us to foster was a uh 60 pound pit bull boxer mix who's the sweetest sweetest guy 
but I oh my god, him. he was so high strung and like very strong and very like wanted to chew everything. He was a handful and a half. Um, and I love him. And I'm so glad we had him. Like I'm a, I'm a pity lover now because of having had him. Um, but my real, like my, my main goal was like, I want to foster kittens. Like I'm a cat person and I want kittens, like just an endless stream of kittens. It is. Everyone's like, you're never going to be able to do that. Like, how are you ever going to give them up? You're just going to want to adopt them all. And I'm like, no, you underestimate my ability to love things with my whole heart and also be able to let them go. And I prove them right. <laughs> so, oh, good. Um, last October, I got my first uh, foster kitten and she was, she was a solo and her name was Tyra. Uh, although we called her Theodosia Purr because we're Hamilton nerds. She <laughs> was just the light of our lives she was the sweetest thing and it was so fascinating she was a bottle baby when i got her so i was learning to like take care of a little tiny bottle baby and then watching her grow up and wean and develop a personality and like she was only i think eight weeks when we had to bring her back to the shelter to be put up for adoption but oh my god it was so much fun and it was so rewarding so I, since then, because by the time we got done with her, it was like December and kitten season was well and truly over. So I've been waiting and like kitten season is just starting now. And I've been like, come on, give me more kittens. So this past Wednesday, um, my partner and I went and got our first COVID shots. Hooray. Um, and like, while we were out, I get a call from the shelter, like, Hey, we have three foster kittens. We have three kittens that need fostering. Are you up for it? And I went, said to my partner, I was like, Hey, do you want to like foster three kittens? He's like, why are you even at, why aren't you just saying like, we're going to foster more kittens. <laughs> and so we have them here. They've been sleeping very kindly. Um, this one is my little Panther. Uh, for some reason, they're four weeks old. So they're still bottle babies. Um, oh. Them Several times a day. I know, baby, I woke you up. Um, for some reason, the shelter named them all Zoe. Um, they are boys, and I applaud their gender flexibility. But I also want to know who was high when they named them all Zoe. So we re have renamed them for our purposes. So this is Mr. Good Sir. <laughs> and he is a little sweetheart. He's probably the gentlest of all of them. And also, I don't know if you can see, he has tiny little black beans. Oh. He has little black beans. And um, this one is Samuel Peeps because he peeps a lot. And not pee pee, but well, he does pee pee a lot, but, uh, <laughs> but he makes these cute little peeping noises. But yeah, he's, he, and he's like, he's such a cuddle bug. Like he, that's all he wants to do is be up on me and snuggling. And then we have their tiny, their littlest brother who we named Tad Cooper after the, the dragon in Galahad because we super believe in him. And I love it. He's he's like a little asshole, but in a really cute way, and he has the most expressive face. And yeah, he's always trying to steal his brother's food, which is good because oh. I had trouble getting them to eat it first. So oh, good. Yeah, so I'm like, good, like try and steal it, but you know, maybe just eat your own food. <laughs> I kind of love animals who are little assholes, though. At least to I a certain do. extent. It's very entertaining. And like just seeing like one of them's on the bottle and he's like and the other one's like trying to steal the bottle and then he'll just go like but he's like doesn't even stop suckling on the bottle. It's hilarious. So much personality in these little guys. I and I'm sure you know this, but I'm like a diehard dog person, but those cats are fucking adorable. Oh my god. I'm and I live for me. all your dog pictures, by the way. I still have Perfect. not gotten over the picture of Christopher the puppy. Oh. <laughs> so for those listening, it. you probably don't know any of this because um, this is all on my personal Facebook profile. But uh, I do work in a doggy treat shop by day. So I am prone to posting pictures of adorable dogs on my feed. And Diva is one of the few people, not few people, but people who gets to uh, enjoy that. And... Um, yeah, there was an absolutely oh so heart melting puppy that I met recently named Christopher, and it was the best. He was a Christopher, like yeah, he really he was. was a weird dog name, but it was totally very appropriate. Yeah, 
and you know, before I worked in the doggy treat shop, I was a dog walker, so there was a lot of dog pictures there as well. Yeah, dogs I got to know better, but um, I you know I don't want to work in a doggy treat shop forever, but I at least like being able to show the little bits of joy with people that um get exactly. to see them. And I'm living vicariously through that because um, after we had Chance, our our pit bull, we just realized like. I had a housemate living here at the time who's since moved out. And just like with two of us, we're like, there's, we just can't keep up with the level of care that a dog requires right now. And it kind of breaks my heart because I love dogs and I wish that I could foster more of them. But, um, you know, like at some point my life will be set up to have dogs. But in the meantime, I'm looking at everybody else's adorable dog pictures and like playing with their doggies when I get to. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'm definitely blessed in that I got to hang out with dogs without the responsibility of owning one. But I really hope I can get to a place where I can own one in the not too distant future. My my whole problem is that like I'm such a city boy, mm-hmm. but I want a fucking big fluffy dog. Oh yeah, the like I dog. want a dog that can knock me over. <laughs> like, like I like animals that could eat me if they wanted to, but would prefer to cuddle. Mm-hmm. That's my shit. Um, and I mean I don't believe in buying from breeders but if i could pick a breed a golden retriever would be my absolute favorite um and this comes from someone who had a half golden as a kid so i'm a little bit attached um but there is a golden retriever that lives next door to me who is always in the window when i walk by and i wave and she like perks up and it's the best thing in the world for me so i'm and i i lived next door to her for like a year before I finally got to meet her, which was like a month ago. And that I'm just like, Oh, this dog. She reminds me so much of the dog I had as a kid. So that's why. Yeah. Our next door neighbors have two goldens as well. And there was one day I opened my front door to go out someplace and sitting right there is a golden retriever who then proceeded to just walk into the house. (laughs) And my neighbors were so apologetic. And I was like, are you kidding me? This is the best thing that's happened all day. He can come visit (laughs) whenever he wants to. (laughs) I would have been like, your dog is moving in with me. I'll never talk to you again. Bye. (laughs) (laughs) We're here now. Well, I'm going to them because like they, they've occasionally like mowed our lawn and just done nice things out of the goodness of their hearts. So I want to sort of wrap, start wrapping up things here. But of course, there is the ending element that I like to implement for everyone's satisfaction, I hope. Mine, at least. And that is the part called getting suggestive. <laughs> and that is simply the part where I ask, what do you suggest for our audience? What are you gagged, obsessed, super excited about? What's on your mind right now? I have been totally obsessed lately with YouTube diving um, because I'm finding that like I just need like comforting familiar things so like when I hook into like a good format on YouTube uh, that has like a million videos I'm like oh thank god you know so my latest deep dive has been um, Screen Rant pitch meetings and it's basically like it's this comedian who um, he pretend he's, he plays both the studio executive and the writer and he takes current movies and breaks them down and like, and does it like, does the pitch meeting and basically is pointing out all the ridiculous and like absurd and stupid stuff about the movies, but in a like really funny, good hearted way. Like he's not, it doesn't come across as mean spirited and it's the same format and the same jokes and like whatever like every single time and i can watch it for hours like i just never get tired of it um another thing i during the pandemic i got really obsessed with um college humor and their streaming service dropout um i just think they're hilarious in general but uh one of the things that i've really been into which will appeal to any nerds in your audience is they have a game show called Um Actually. And it's <laughs> <laughs> three of their, like, either their comedians or, like, you know, guests from, like, different, like, nerd places. Um, and, like, people who are, like, well-known in, like, fandoms and stuff like that. And, uh, 
they do it. Uh, they basically uh, every question is a statement about some nerd property, um, and you have to be able to correct the tiny obscure thing that's wrong with it. But you have to preface it by saying "um actually," or you don't get the point. It's amazing and like, like Jeopardy with what is exactly exactly, and it's so funny because so many of these people are professional comedians, but it's also like. Like if you like testing your nerd pride, because I'm also like a big trivia geek. So I'm just like, how smart do I feel that like I got that correct, you know, kind of thing. Oh, so um, all of that stuff is like, yeah, all, deep diving the internet. Like that's been my obsession <laughs> since we shut down. <laughs> that's real good. Yeah. Um, so for my getting suggestive, I was really trying to make this week, the first week, I did not say a single word about anything related to RuPaul's Drag Race and then something <laughs> happened. Um, do you watch Drag Race at all? I have not, no. That's okay. That's okay. Um, I, for, I will enlighten you and anyone listening who might not be up to date. So, context. For this past season of RuPaul's Drag Race UK, which is season two, uh, there was a girl group challenge where four queens well two teams of four queens each had to record their own version of a song that ended up being one of the most infectious earworms that has graced our ears in the last year and that song is called uk hun and most of the gays probably know what this is at this point um but if not look up uk hun and you probably won't know what's going on, but like you won't be able to deny that it's infectious. It is terrible and it is infectious. Um, it. So yeah, there were two different versions of the song released on the show, but then um, someone else, um, Bob the Drag Queen, Aquaria, and Priyanka, who are previous season winners in United States and Canada, they made their own version and it was, well, Bob the Drag Queen was great. The rest was kind of terrible, but it was still really catchy. But um Season one, there was another girl group challenge where uh, one of the groups that emerged was called the Frock Destroyers. And that was Davina DeCampo, Blue Hydrangea, and Bag of Chips. And they've actually become a real group and started touring and released a whole album. Oh, and cool. shortly after UK Hun became a thing, I tweeted – at least a month ago. Is it wrong of me to want a Frock Destroyers version of UK Hun? I just tweeted it out into the ether. No one really noticed it. But then last week, as the previous episode was being recorded, <laughs> they announced that the Frock Destroyers were releasing a version of UK Hun with oh. season two winner Lawrence Cheney, but just like the, the verse that she recorded for the show, so it wasn't anything special there. But... I woke up the next morning and I was like, oh my God, I got my wish. That's amazing. The internet provides, man. <laughs> I was not expecting this. Um, and I don't know if I helped inspire it in any way, but I would like to believe I did. In my head canon, you did. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I, I accept your head canon as fact. Um, and then uh, even better, uh, after a few days of listening to it like five times a day, um, I just felt snarky and wanting attention. So I tweeted, um, what did I write? Oh, I wrote that my favorite part of the Frock Destroyers version of UK Hun is when Davina DeCampo rhymes over with over twice. <laughs> <laughs> and I tagged her because I'm talking shit. And <laughs> she saw it and she was tweeting like, we don't just turn up, you know? <laughs> So I, I and I just wrote back "love you" and she hit the like button. I was like, I feel validated today. I can, yeah, feel accomplished. And that's a good segue into asking before we wrap up for this episode. Where can people track you down on the interwebs um, that you I, like? Fortunately, I, I finally finished my new website, which is I've been rebuilding for ages. Um, that is divanations.com. And uh, all my stuff is on there. Um, if you want to see more about Smut Slam DC specifically, I have a whole other website at dc.smutslam.com. 
Um, and those places are a good, a good starting point because you'll find my Instagram and my Twitter and my Facebook and all that stuff on there. Um, I'm starting to write on a service called Vocal. Um, it's kind of like Medium, but you know, um, it's a little seems a little bit more fiction driven and like it has some really cool features. So I'll be putting more content up there. But um, but those are probably the two best places right now. Thank you so much for joining me so enthusiastically Absolutely. for this little project of mine and for sharing your kittens with us as well. Thank you so much. This was fantastic. I'm like, sorry, not sorry that I corralled you in the middle of my show to be like, can I be on your podcast? <laughs> I'm not sorry that you did it all. It was very uh, serendipitous. Yes. I always right. love getting to hang out with you. So this is like just a win all around. I concur. All right, have a great night. Hey, thanks so much for listening to Suggestive Language. If you had a good time, please hit that subscribe button and tell a friend or two. You can catch episodes live Monday nights on Twitch at 9 p.m. Handle Intellectual Homosexual. And always, you can listen on your podcast platform of choice every Wednesday. See you again soon. <laughs>